The Old Testament reading for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost comes from Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to, how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He wakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is, small, is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we likewise curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing, arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked one of your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation." How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you, can, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. 
Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the gospel of the Lord. Be to thee, O Christ. word of God today is from the epistle reading two verses reads with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it curse men who have been made in God's likeness out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing my brothers this should not be God who made us to be the first fruits of his creation grace mercy and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ amen who said this look at that face would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that? The face of our next president? Who said it? Donald Trump. The text for today is about the use of our tongues, and no one seems to be able to control Donald Trump, nor he his tongue. And as we are quite associated with this season of the election, the presidential election, there will be a lot of tongue wagging, a lot of speaking out of both sides of the mouth, a lot of forked tongue speaking, and boasting and putting down, and we just hate it and can't wait for the presidential election season to be over. Yet Donald Trump seems to be winning in the polls because he's touching a nerve with most Americans who are just simply fed up with all the rhetoric and nothing getting done, fed up with special interest groups stuffing their agendas down our throat and making us eat it and then telling us it's the law, you can't do anything about it, and just simply fed up with those who are trying to rule in the left-hand kingdom and not seeking God's wisdom. As a result of all this, we are influenced by the media sensation of tongue wagging and we get caught up in it and we do the same. The tongue, it's a good member of our body. God created it good. But then a fallen angel, Lucifer, entered the picture with his forked tongue and said, did God really say? And by those four words, Adam and Eve hearkened to that lying tongue and you know the rest of history. Adam blamed Eve and ultimately God who gave Eve to him. And Eve blamed the serpent. And the tongue has spilled out its poison over our lips from then on. What's at stake here is the war between Satan and God over mankind. Satan uses his tongue to destroy God's beautiful creation and ultimately man in whom God uh, placed his image and a living soul. God, Satan caused man to be cast out of paradise and into the darkness of estrangement with God. Consequently then, we are born in the likeness of fallen Adam and Eve and in the kingdom of darkness. But God in his sovereignty will not have one of his creatures control him. God would win us back, and he would do it in the second person of the Godhead, who assumed into his deity our human flesh. Jesus, true God and true man, came as our mighty redeemer. His tongue spoke the truth, for Jesus is the word of truth. St. Peter testified that Jesus committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. My friends, this is the powerful result of our mighty Redeemer. 
Jesus brought his righteousness to our sinful tongue before God. Jesus set us free from our guilt and fears that our sinful tongue often brings to us and lifts us from the shame that our uncontrolled tongue often heaps upon us. Then Jesus grants us a place next to him, all because of his perfect, obedient tongue and cleansing, ransoming life. So we can say, now look here, Satan, you threatening one. Your tongue has been disarmed to accuse any of God's elect. And not only that, you wicked one, Jesus has broke down the walls of death's fortress that you built up. For Jesus, whom you crushed on the cross, didn't see decay, but rose from the dead and burst through hell in the grave, the sealed tomb, and Jesus lives and reigns forever and ever. Jesus, our mighty redeemer, controls you now, Satan. He is your master. Beloved saints here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, do you see this truth that Jesus, by the power of his word, desires that you be the Christian master over your tongue in accordance to who you are, a redeemed child of God? Please do. See this redeeming and sanctifying work by God in you. In the gospel reading, it was the demon in the possessed man who caused the members of his body to be uncontrollable and vile, even his tongue. But God, by his word, cast out that evil spirit from that man's body. You and I are saints before God, but at the same time still sinners as long as we live on this side of heaven. We confess Jesus is the Lord of our life, but Satan also wants to rule in us. That's the dichotomy that we live with. There's that constant struggle of doing what's right, but then still fall into the temptation of doing what's wrong, using our tongue to praise God, but yet with it curse men who are made in God's image. Satan knows this struggle that we deal with every day, and so Satan is still alive and seeking to get back at God. Satan uses the tongue to nullify Christ's redemption, one for you and for every Christian. God sets before us in his word through the pen of St. James about the power and influence of the tongue. James uses metaphors to describe how something so small can steer your life. Just as something as small as a bit placed in a horse's mouth can cause the horse to obey its rider, just as a large ship can be steered by a little rudder to go wherever the captain wants to steer the ship, so is the tongue. Such a small member of our body can steer our bodies and our life for good or for evil. James likens the tongue to a fire that's uncontrollable. Just as a spark from a match starts a forest fire, the tongue used wrongly sets the whole course of a person's life on fire. For example, a parent says to his or her child or a teacher to his or her student, at your rate, you're going to grow up and become nothing at all. Such a statement may affect the cycle of that child's life from birth onward. A parent is in anger, yells at their child and says, I hate you and you're the most worthless blankety blank I know. You don't do anything ever right. The child's learned that he or she is to consider God as a dear earthly father. So if dad feels that way about me, I guess God must feel the same way too toward me. Satan loves this interaction, so he uses the tongue to nullify Christ's redemption for that child. A husband and wife gets into an argument, and it gets a little overheated. And so you say something you should not have said and do something you shouldn't have done. You hurt with the words that rolled off the mouth and painfully hurt by whatever action took place. There are tears behind locked doors, or the spouse leaves the house in anger. Finally, by God's grace, you are led to make amends. You say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. What I said 
was wrong of me. Would you please forgive me? After a few moments of conversation, forgiveness is granted, but the relationship feels tenuous. In time, the pain goes away. But when something comes up that leads to discontent, the devil devours your thoughts with that get back attitude, and you bring up again what was said or done in the past when it was said to be forgiven. So the injured spouse again thinks, if my spouse doesn't forgive me, I guess God must not forgive me either. God's absolution through Jesus may be true for others, but it must not be true for me. Jesus' blood may have washed away other people's sins, but not mine, since I'm constantly reminded what I do wrong. Oh, Satan loves this instigation of this interaction. So he keeps using the tongue to nullify Christ's redemption one for you. We know the power of the tongue, and James wants us to be aware how damaging it is, not only to us, but the whole body of Christ, when our tongue is not controlled by the Spirit. The uncontrolled tongue corrupts the whole person and defiles your whole personality. If you are a hell raiser, all the time cursing and blaming everyone around you, even God, for all your problems. You yourself, as St. James warns, are being set on fire by hell. That would be your destiny if you don't quickly realize that Satan is the one behind your rage, and he's the one controlling your mind and your tongue to nullify Christ's redemption for you. When James says, that the tongue is a fire, a world of evil, he means that the tongue is highly influenced by cosmic evil. Well, how do you know that the tongue is controlled by cosmic evil? Well, man can tame an elephant, charm a snake, teach a dog to do tricks, cause a porpoise to put on a good show, but man can't tame his tongue. And so James says, here you are. You praise God with your tongue and then curse men made in God's image. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Fresh and salt water, you know, doesn't flow from the same spring. So neither should praise and cursing come out of the same mouth. To whom will you show allegiance? God or Satan? As Christians, we're all convicted today by the word of God because so many times our tongue does get the best of us. Satan uses the Christian's tongue in an uncontrolled moment to divide a church, break up a Christian marriage, destroy a Christian relationship, all for the purpose to nullify Christ's redemption one for you. So what are we to do? Who are we to turn to for help? You know what I'm going to say. We must turn to Jesus for forgiveness and God the Holy Spirit for help and strength to say and do what's right. You know that is true, but oftentimes it may seem to you that it's just one of these typical Sunday school answers that's used for everything. When daily you ask for forgiveness and strength to help amend your sinful life, but then you find yourself more often than not, losing in that fight and controlling your tongue. Surely, every Christian asked, what can I do in a practical way to prove to myself that I am redeemed and to show my allegiance to Christ, my mighty Redeemer, by the conduct of my life? The following words I share with you may help you to begin that fight to tame the tongue and be victorious by the power of the Holy Spirit. First of all, remember your baptism. Look at that baptismal certificate and know that God acted in that event and claimed you as his own through his atoning sacrifice. Secondly, the Holy Spirit has made your body his holy temple. And God is always through the word creating new attitudes and godly thoughts in your heart and your mind to act upon. Your almighty redeemer has now tied the human speech, your tongue as a member of your temple, to the creative and saving word of God. The implanted word in you 
is able to save souls. And that knowledge ought to move you to put a bridle in your mouth for Jesus' sake. God calls us to use our tongues for salvation purposes, for edification, for building up one another. You are on the Lord's side. And what better way to hinder the power of Satan who tries to nullify Christ's redeeming work when you have the word in your heart and in your mind and on your tongue that can stop Satan and save souls? When you know this, the power and the victory that you have in Christ, the victory and the power of his resurrected life alive in you, you're prepared by the Holy Spirit to exercise control on the tongue so Satan loses and you're the victor. Today as we leave God's house, let the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit work throughout all of your bodily members. Paul says, and James as well, he writes that everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And don't grumble against one another. And then Paul tells us to put into practice, don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit them. And let your conversation always be filled with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may be able to answer it for everything. Put into practice what godly forgiveness means. It means you don't think about the sins of the past that you once were pronounced forgiven. You don't dwell on it. You don't bring it up again, just as God doesn't bring up our sins to remind us when, in fact, he remembers them no more. So when Satan wants you to get back at somebody and bring up the past, remember what forgiveness means and put it into practice and you'll be victorious over Satan. God made you in his image as his redeemed child to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the animals on the, on the ground, and even the crawling serpent with his forked tongue poisonous tongue and as you meditate on God's word and think on heavenly things the Holy Spirit will enable you more and more to not let your tongue have free reign as you control your tongue it's a visible sign you are becoming a mature Christian that's what we all want to be mature Christians so may the Holy Spirit sanctify us all through and through and bring us all at last to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, keep our hearts and mind in Christ, the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand and we sing together, create in me a clean heart, O God.